Is there really a God? If you walked into a great big brick building, would you stand there and conclude it obviously came about as a result of an explosion in a brick factory? Well, of course not. You know that somebody designed that building. A lot of intelligence went into making that building. In the same sort of way, you wouldn't stand in front of Mount Rushmore and say, obviously millions of years of wind and water erosion formed the president's heads. You know that there were sculptors who were involved in designing those heads. You know, in the same sort of way, you look around at the universe, we look around at this earth, we look at life. When you look at the animals, when you look at plants, we can see evidence of intelligence, we see evidence of design, and design implies a designer. But who is that intelligence? Who is that designer? Well, the only way you'd know if that designer were to reveal uh, himself to us. And you know, we have a book called the Bible. It's unique in the world. And the Bible tells us that God has revealed himself to us through his word, the written word, that he moved people by his spirit to write down for us what he wants us to know about who we are, where we came from, what this world is all about, what life is all about. In fact, the Bible uh, claims to be God breathed, that God by his spirit moved people to write down his words. And so it is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. And if the Bible really is God's word, then of course, if history revealed to us and there is true, it should make sense of the world. For instance, if there really was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth, fossils all over the earth. That's what we find. The reason there are different people groups with different languages, the Tower of Babel. The reason we have a world in which we see life and death, where we see joy and sadness all at the same time, it's the Bible that explains that, a perfect world marred by sin. And you know, another thing that we have to understand as well, we believe in the laws of nature, the laws of logic, the uniformity of nature, but why? It's only on the basis of a biblical worldview that that makes sense. If it was a random universe, then why would we have the laws of nature? Why would we have the laws of logic? Uh, it wouldn't make sense at all. Uh, from a perspective of a random universe, why should we be able to logically argue with each other? It's obvious that there's a Creator God. But where did that God come from? Well, as a little boy once said to me, Mr. Ham, who made God? Well, if somebody made God, would have to be a bigger God. You see, the only thing that makes sense is you have to have the biggest God of all, which is what the Bible tells us, an infinite Creator God who's always been there, outside of time, who brought everything into existence. Why shouldn't Christians accept millions of years? Why shouldn't Christians accept millions of years? Today, most Christians seem to accept that idea, and they have for the last 200 years. But there are a number of reasons why we shouldn't. First of all, the evidence in Genesis 1 is that the days of creation were literal. God defined a day uh, in verse 5. He used uh, numbers, first day, second day, third day. We also get an idea of how long ago these days were in Genesis 5 and 11, where we have the genealogies from Adam to Noah and Noah to Abraham. And so those tell us how long ago the creation was. A second reason is Exodus 20, verse 11. God gives the commandment to the Israelites to work six days and rest on the seventh because he created in six days the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. We can't have any creation before the six days, and God uses the same word for days in both parts of the commandment, showing that God created in six literal days. The third reason we should ex reject the millions of years is because of Noah's flood. Noah's flood literally washes away those millions of years, because that millions of years idea came from, supposedly, the geological record. But it came as a result of, of geologists in the early 19th century rejecting the biblical account of the flood and then using anti-biblical assumptions to interpret the rocks and the fossils. But Noah's flood is described in Genesis as a global catastrophe, so it would have produced exactly the kind of geological record we see today of, of thousands of feet of sedimentary rocks and fossils buried in them. A fourth reason is Jesus' view. Jesus always took the Old Testament uh, accounts in Genesis as literal history. And in Mark chapter 10, verse 6, Jesus is responding to a question by the Pharisees about divorce. And he says, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. He then quotes from Genesis 1 and 2. So Jesus is saying that 
Adam and Eve were right back there at the beginning of creation, not billions of years after the beginning, as the evolutionists would want us to believe. A fifth reason we should reject the millions of years idea is because of the Bible's teaching about death. The Bible says in Genesis 1 that God created a perfect creation. It was very good. People and animals ate plants. They didn't eat animals. And then God cursed the creation, bringing death into the creation. And so Paul says in Romans 8 that the whole creation is now in bondage to corruption. A sixth reason is because science has not proven millions of years. See, the millions of years doesn't come from the rocks and the fossils. It comes from the interpretation of those things. And those interpretations are based on anti-biblical assumptions that dominate the scientific community today. So the rocks don't say millions of years, it is the interpretation. And finally, uh, we should reject this because the radiometric dating methods are not foolproof methods for giving us the age of rocks. Those methods are based on anti-biblical assumptions again, and there is good reason uh, to believe scientifically that those assumptions are false. So ultimately, the real battle here is not between science and religion, it's a battle over authority. Will we believe the Word of God, who was there at the beginning, who knows everything, who always tells the truth, who never lies, and who gave us an inspired account so that we would have the truth about where this world came from, why it is the way it is, and where it's going? Or will we believe the fallible opinions of sinful men called scientists who don't know everything, who make mistakes, and who are trying to explain the world without God so they do not have to be morally accountable to Him? It's an issue of authority, and we need to believe God's Word. Cain's wife, who was she? In the Bible in the New Testament, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, that Adam was the first man. Now in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, in chapter 3 and verse 20, we read that Eve was to be the mother of all the living. So according to the Bible, all human beings alive today, all human beings that have ever lived, are descendants of one man and one woman, Adam and Eve. There is only one race of human beings. Skeptics of the Bible often ask if God made Adam and Eve, and they had three sons, Cain, Abel, and Seth, as recorded in Genesis, then where did Cain get his wife? Well, Genesis chapter 5 verse 4 records that Adam had other sons and daughters. In fact, Jewish tradition is they had over 50 children. That means originally, brothers would have had to have married sisters. Now people say, wait a minute, brothers aren't allowed to marry sisters. Even the Bible says that. Well, Abraham was married to his half-sister, and that wasn't a problem. Actually, it wasn't until the time of Moses that God said in Leviticus, no longer can close relatives marry. So why is it that close relatives could marry originally, but close relatives shouldn't marry today? When Adam was created, his genes were perfect. Eve's genes were perfect. But Adam sinned. And as a result of sin, God no longer holds everything together perfectly. So now everything runs down. The further away in relationship you are from each other, the more likely it is that you have different mistakes. And so when you get married and have children, you get a good gene from one partner with a bad gene from the other. And the good gene tends to mask the bad gene so it doesn't show up in the next generation to, to a great extent in the sense of a deformity or some major problem. But the further back you go in history, the less of a problem that is. You see, originally, Adam and Eve had no mistakes. Their children would have had relatively few. So provided it was one man for one woman, which is what the doctrine of marriage is all about, there was no problem with uh, close relatives marrying originally. So you see, it's easy to understand where did Cain get his wife. Cain's wife was one of his relatives, a close relative at that time, but one of his relatives, just as we marry our relative today. Doesn't carbon-14 dating disprove the Bible? Does radiocarbon disprove the Bible? Absolutely not. In fact, we're going to see that it's a great asset to us. But let's discuss what radiocarbon and dating is all about. It's otherwise known as carbon-14 dating, and it is based on the carbon-14 atom. Radiocarbon, most people think of carbon-14 or radiocarbon as being used to date rocks. Well, in fact, you can't date rocks with radiocarbon for two reasons. One, because most rocks don't contain carbon, but more importantly, radiocarbon decays very rapidly. 
To give you, uh, put it in perspective, radiocarbon de decays so quickly that if every atom of the Earth was radiocarbon, within just one million years, there'd be no radiocarbon atoms left. It would all have decayed away. Which is why geologists don't use radiocarbon to, say, date fossils, simply because the fossils they believe are millions of years old. And uh, I was involved in a research study recently where we took coal samples from coal that was 40 million years old, supposedly, down to coal that was supposedly 300 million years old. And we sent it to a major laboratory, a recognised university laboratory for radiocarbon, and every one of those coal samples contained radiocarbon, in it, detectable radiocarbon. And we fully expected that they would contain radiocarbon because most of the world's major laboratories have already reported radiocarbon in coal, in limestone and fossils, but they, they don't think about it in terms of an age, a true age for the rocks. And it didn't matter whether the coal was supposedly 40 million years old or 300 million years old, it had the same amount of detectable radiocarbon in it and it gave a young age of only tens of thousands of years. Similarly, I've collected uh, shells in rocks that are supposed to be 150, 120 million years old in Northern California, and they also give a radiocarbon age of tens of thousands of years. Now that makes sense because the coal was laid down during Noah's flood. It's plants that were fossilized in beds during the flood. So they all were fossilized, buried and fossilized in the same year long event. So we'd expect them to give the same radiocarbon age. Of course, that radiocar those radiocarbon ages are based on the assumption that radiocarbon has always been produced in the atmosphere at the rate we find today. We know that the Earth's magnetic field was stronger in the past, which means that the radiocarbon production rate would have been slower in the past which means that those dates are highly inflated. When we take into account what the radiocarbon was like at the time of the flood, those ages of tens of thousands years of years come down to about four to five thousand years. We even tested diamonds for radiocarbon and found that they did contain radiocarbon. Diamonds are found inside the earth at very great depths and they are part of the initial makeup of the Earth. So these diamonds give a young radiocarbon age, which implies that the Earth is, is very young. So in fact, when we look at the real hard facts of radiocarbon dating and the results that we get, we find that radiocarbon actually agrees with the Bible, confirms what the Bible has already said about Earth history, that the Earth is young and that was a global catastrophic flood. Was there really a Noah's Ark and flood? In Genesis chapter 6 through 9 in the Bible, we read there about an account of a global flood in the time of Noah. That flood, according to the Bible, was sent by our Creator God because of the wickedness of man as a judgment because of their rebellion against their Creator. Now Noah was called by God to build a boat for he and his family and representatives of all the animal kinds, the land animal kinds, to survive this global flood. Was there really such a flood? Could Noah really build such an ark that would fit all the representatives of the land animal kinds on board the ark? Actually, if there really was a global flood that covered the highest hills under the whole of heaven, as the Bible describes, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And actually, what we find are billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. I'm talking about the fossil record. Most of the fossil record is actually the graveyard of the flood of Noah's day, not a result of millions of years of deposition, as the secularists tell us. There really was a global flood. The evidence is crying out at us from all over the earth. But could Noah actually build such a boat to take two of every kind of land-dwelling, air-breathing animal? Well, actually, yes. And in fact, most people don't realize he didn't need to take near as many animals on board the ark as we might think. For instance, today we have, when you look at dogs, dingoes, wolves, coyotes, jackals, bennet, foxes, and so it goes on, and our domestic dogs. Well, no, he didn't take all those on board the ark. Actually, he'd only need two dogs. When those dogs came off the ark after the flood, eventually different species formed. Dingoes, wolves, coyotes. That's not evolution, by the way. That's just dogs. That's just representing variation within the gene pool of the dog kind. When you actually work it out, Noah needed far fewer animals on board the ark 
than most people think. Actually, when you look at the size of the ark, as the dimensions are, are recorded in the Bible, you realize that Noah really built a boat bigger than what he really needed. Why would that be? Well, God is a gracious God. And you know, when the animals were on board the ark and Noah and his family are on board the ark, that ark then stood for seven days before God shut the door. What was happening during those seven days? Well, the Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. I believe he was calling the people of that time to come on board the ark and to come through the doorway to be saved. But they scoffed at God's word and then God shut the door. Actually, Noah's ark is a picture of salvation. You see, there's a coming judgment by fire, not by water next time. And God's provided an ark of salvation for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he will be saved. Jesus is our ark of salvation. And just as surely as there was a flood, and we see the evidence all over the earth in the fossil record, just as surely there's going to be coming judgment by fire. There's also other evidence that Noah's flood really occurred. Did you know that there are cultures all over the world that have flood legends? I'm sure many of us have heard of the flood legends, the American Indians, the Fijians, the Hawaiians, Eskimos, the Australian Aborigines, back to the Babylonians. Many of those flood legends just sound like the account of the flood in Genesis chapter six through nine. They're different, they've been changed, but the elements are there. How could that be? Well, that flood really occurred and Noah and his family knew about the flood and of course that information was passed to their children and on to their children and so on through the Tower of Babel to the different people groups we see around the world today. But the real record is in the Bible. It hasn't changed. But the fact that we have flood legends attests to the fact that the Bible really is true. It really is the true history book of the universe. What really happened to the dinosaurs? Many people are perplexed by the topic of dinosaurs. Where did they come from? When did they live? What happened to them? You see, when you dig up a dinosaur skeleton, it doesn't come with a label attached saying, hi, I'm 65 million years old and this is what happened to me. We have to interpret that skeleton in relation to the past. So where did dinosaurs come from? What happened to them? When did they live? I want to show you that when you take God at his word in the book of Genesis, that we can explain dinosaurs and observational science actually confirms that explanation based upon the Bible. See, the Bible tells us that God made the land animals on day six of creation. And who else was created on day six? Well, Adam and Eve. And how long ago was that? Well, when you add up all the dates in the Bible, about 6,000 years. So taking God at his word in Genesis, dinosaurs lived beside people about 6,000 years ago. And they were vegetarian to start with. Genesis chapter one, verse 29 tells us that all the animals were vegetarian. But then Adam sinned and because of sin, everything changed. The whole of creation now groans because of sin. In fact, after the event of Noah's flood, God told Noah that now humans could eat meat, could eat animal flesh. But before that time, they were instructed only to be vegetarian. So sometime after sin, obviously animals started changing their diets as well. And the Bible tells us that there was a global flood and two of every kind of land-dwelling, air-breathing animal went on board the boat that Noah built, Noah's Ark. Now, people often say, wait a minute, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dinosaur kinds. No, there might be hundreds of dinosaur names, and many of those names are given to different variations within a dinosaur kind. But when you actually work through it, there's probably less than 50 dinosaur kinds. The T-Rex type kind, the raptor type kind, the sauropod type kind, and so it goes on. And the other thing to remember is that the average size of a dinosaur is only the size of a sheep or a German shepherd dog or a small pony or something like that. You see, some of the dinosaurs did grow large, like the sauropods, but even they hatched from eggs and were once young adults, and so would not have been that large. Actually, there was plenty of room on board Noah's Ark for two of every kind of the dinosaur kind. And I'm sure that God chose those young adults that were ready for the new world to populate in the new world. What happened to those land animals that didn't go on board the Ark? They were drowned. Many of them turned into fossils. The dinosaur fossils we find, most of them probably come from the time of the flood over 4,300 years ago, and therefore they're only thousands of years old, not millions of years old. Those that came off the ark started to spread out over the earth, and then, because of changing conditions, many animals have become extinct, including the dinosaurs. Really, for animals to become extinct is nothing new. We see it happening every year. Now, is there any evidence that's consistent with that explanation of dinosaurs? 
Actually, there is lots of evidence consistent with that. We have dragon legends all over the earth, just as we have flood legends. Flood legends attest to the fact there was a real flood. Dragon legends attest to the fact there were real animals called dragons, and the descriptions of those creatures in many instances fit the dinosaurs. And then there are cave paintings all over the earth done by people hundreds of years ago who drew animals that they were familiar with, and some of those paintings look just like the dinosaurs. And you know, there's even indication in the Bible of a dinosaur that lived beside a man after the flood. Go and read the book of Job, Job chapter 40, verse 15. For him, the largest land animal God made, the description fits something like a sauropod dinosaur living with Job after the flood. We've also found in our present world dinosaur bones with what appear to be red blood cells and soft tissue still in them, indicating they can't be millions of years old. You know, when people ask me what happened to the dinosaurs, my usual answer is, well, they died. But of course, they didn't die out millions of years ago. Many died at the time of the flood. And those that were alive on Noah's Ark, their descendants died out sometime after the flood. It's the Bible's history that explains dinosaurs. Does distant starlight prove the universe is old? One of the most common questions that I uh, get asked when people find out that I'm a creation astronomer is what about distant starlight? How did God get the light from those distant galaxies to Earth in thousands of years that the Bible says were the, the age of the universe? Well, there are actually several different ways to get light to travel those enormous regions in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, one, one way is what's called an anisotropic synchrony convention. And that's a little bit like uh, time zones on the Earth. You know, I can leave uh, Kentucky at around 4 o'clock in their plane and arrive in Colorado at 4 o'clock without going infinitely fast or anything like that. And the reason is because the way time is defined on Earth, we use a local time convention as we travel across the world. As long as I'm going west, that'll work. Well, a similar thing can be done in space, and in fact has been done since uh, ancient times. And so perhaps God is using that, that anisotropic time zone uh, model of zones out in space there. And so light can travel those enormous regions in no time at all. Light can be created with the star on, the day, on day four, and it can arrive on Earth on day four, you see, so it's not really an issue. But there are other creationists that have proposed that God used uh, perhaps time dilation, uh, gravitational time dilation, for example. Einstein tells us that time can flow at different rates in different environments. That's something that we've demonstrated with atomic clocks. We know it's true. So perhaps time flows more slowly on Earth than it does in the distant region of the universe because the Earth is in a gravitational uh, well. That is, it's near the center of a finite amount of galaxies and therefore time would flow more slowly on Earth than it does out in the distant regions of space. And so light can trickle in at its own slow rate, but on Earth only thousands of years elapses. That's an interesting possibility. There's also an offshoot of that called uh, Carmelian physics that would allow basically the same thing to happen, but it adds an extra dimension to, uh, to a general relativity. So these are interesting possibilities. But we should also keep in mind the possibility that God may have used a supernatural mechanism. After all, God is not bound by the laws of nature as we are, especially during the creation week when God was doing things in a supernatural rather than a naturalistic uh, way. And so that's certainly a possibility as well. It may be that we can't understand how an infinite God could do it, but that doesn't mean that he can't do it. He's after all infinite. One answer that we would not recommend using is that God simply created the beams of light already on their way. And the reason we don't uh, think that that's a good answer is because we see things happen in space. We see stars explode, for example. And if, uh, if God just created the beam en route, then that means that the star that we saw explode never really happened. God just painted a picture of that explosion along this light beam, uh, when in fact the star never exploded, never even existed. And so I don't think that God is going to create pictures of fictional events out in space there. And if he did out in space, why not here on Earth? We really couldn't trust our senses if God created light beams that, that don't really come from their source. So I don't think that's the best explanation. And another thing I want to point out, though, is that the Big Bang, the alternative to biblical creation, also has a similar type of problem, a light travel time problem of its own. It's called the horizon problem. And basically it has to do with the cosmic microwave background that we see uh, streaming from the distant regions of the universe. We find that it's very uniform. And that shouldn't be, because in the Big Bang model, uh, it should have different temperatures at different places. Why is it so uniform? Obviously, light energy had to travel from the, the hotter regions to the cooler regions to equilibrate those temperatures, but there hasn't been enough time. Even in 13.7 billion years, there's not enough time for light to travel from one side of the visible universe to the other. 
And so that's a light travel time problem for the Big Bang. It seems to me that if the alternative to biblical creation has the same type of problem as biblical creation, then you can't argue that distant starlight somehow disproves biblical creation in favor of the Big Bang. And after all, God is omniscient. He could have used a mechanism that we do know about, or he could have used a mechanism that we don't know about. But it's not a problem for an infinite God to get light from distant galaxies to Earth in thousands of years. How did defense attack structures come about? In today's society, a lot of people ask the question about defense attack structures. Defense attack structures are basically like the sharp teeth or the claws on animals that seem like they're very well designed to go out and kill and eat other animals. Uh, a defense structure would be something like a turtle shell to protect against those sorts of things. And the reason people ask this question goes back to Genesis uh, chapter 1 verses 30 and 31. In Genesis 31, the Lord declares that everything was very good, that it was perfect. So we would expect a God of life to produce a world that's full of life, not a world full of death. So why would there be the sharp claws and the, and the sharp teeth and things like that that seem so well designed uh, for eating other things? Uh, in Genesis 1.31, God declares that everything that He had created was very good. It was perfect. It exceeded good if such a thing were possible. And so people then turn around and ask, well, what about these defense attack structures? What about claws and sharp teeth, things like that, that, that seem like they're so well designed to go out and kill and eat other animals? Well, what about turtle shells, you know, a defense structure there, uh, you know, to protect itself from these sorts of things? Well, that's actually kind of a decent question. And really, there's two positions on that within Christendom. The first one is that sharp teeth and claws are simply that, sharp teeth and claws. That doesn't mean that uh, sharp teeth actually implies that you're eating meat. It just means that they have sharp teeth. Now, what does this position really entail then? Well, it means that those sharp teeth and those claws were used for a different purpose. For example, uh, fruit bats have really sharp teeth and yet they eat fruit. Panda bears have sharp teeth and yet uh, what do they eat? Vegetation. Uh, so, you know, so that's one position. Squirrels have uh, uh, really sharp claws, but what do they use those claws for? Well, they use them for climbing up and down trees. Uh, so they're used for a different purpose. That's that particular position. Uh, the second perspective on this is, uh, and, and the key passage for this is in Genesis chapter 3, and it talks about design changes or potential design changes here specifically. Uh, if we read uh, in Genesis 3 verse 14, it talks about uh, the serpent being cursed, but the serpent wasn't all, all the only thing that was cursed in this particular passage, the other animals were also cursed to a certain degree. How much? We really don't know. But what was the curse of the serpent? Well, cursed are you. You're going to crawl on your belly. You're going to eat dust all the days of your life. Whether the serpent had appendages or not is not really for this discussion, but uh, there was some form of change there. At that point, what were these other curses to the other animals? Could they have been sharp teeth? Could they have been uh, sharp claws? Things like that. Is that when some of these design, uh, defense and attack structures came about? Well, it's possible. You know, if we read further into Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, uh, to the woman specifically, there's increased pain and sorrows in childbearing. You know, and that didn't just stick with Eve, that's been passed along to other ladies. And you ladies out there who are listening, uh, you guys have done an, an incredible job with this. Uh, my wife gave birth not too long ago. But think about the, the man. You know, we're going to work by the sweat of our brow. It's going to be tough to do. There's this uh, physical type of suffering here that's been passed along as well uh, because of man's sin back in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, but think further. Cursed is the ground because of you. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. There was even some sort of design changes to vegetation to bring, bring forth these thorns and thistles. Perhaps some of these sharp teeth and claws and that sort of thing uh, occurred at that time just to help animals survive in this sin-cursed and broken world. Now, I would leave open uh, the first position, maybe even the second position. In fact, I would even leave open the option that uh, it's a combination of the two. Is natural selection the same thing as evolution? So is natural selection the same thing as evolution? Well, the short answer to that is no, but let's take a more in-depth look at why that's the case. And the first thing we need to do is define natural selection and evolution. Now, see, natural selection is an observable process in which organisms with certain characteristics survive better in a given environment. And there's a loss of information in the DNA. Genetic information decreases as a result of this process. Now, evolution is defined as an unobservable process which has occurred over long periods of time in which a single-celled organism has become all the organisms that we have today and have had in the past. It's directional in the sense that dinosaurs have evolved into birds, and genetic information must increase in order for this process to occur. So as you can see from the definitions, they're very, very different. 
But let's take a look at an example to really help us illustrate this difference better. And one of the most used and abused examples of evolution in action, which is really natural selection in action, is the development of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. See, when you have a bacterial infection and you take an antibiotic, you expect it to kill the bacteria. But sometimes the bacteria have a mutation in them that has allowed them to um, not be killed by the antibiotics. And so they survive better or select it for in that particular environment because of that mutation. However, they have to pay a price for that mutation. And if the environment changes, say for example, the antibiotic is removed, they're not considered as fit and they're less likely to survive. So what have we really observed here? Well, first of all, bacteria remain bacteria, it's non-directional, and genetic information has been lost as a result of this process. So uh, even if you give natural selection long periods of time, such as millions of years, it simply can't do what evolution requires of it, which is to be, move in a certain direction and to add genetic information. There's no doubt that natural selection has led to changes uh, within kinds of animals. And when we talk about kind, we mean a biblical category of animal uh, that God has talked about in His Word, that He created animals according to their kinds, which we would put at about the family level in modern classification scheme. So, for example, natural selection may have led to speciation or variation within the cat kind, such that we have different species of cats, like wild cats and domestic cats, but it's not led from one kind of animal evolving into another, such as dinosaurs evolving into birds. Rather, natural selection is a God-ordained process that has allowed organisms to survive in a post-fall world. It acts on the variations within the kinds and preserves the viability of those kinds. So natural selection cannot be a mechanism or a process for evolution because it simply does not have that power. Rather, it's a great confirmation of the Bible's history. Did dinosaurs turn into birds? Did dinosaurs evolve into birds? That's certainly widely believed today. In fact, uh, most evolutionists now classify the birds under the dinosauria. So you might say birds aren't extinct, or dinosaurs aren't extinct. Uh, they're feeding from our bird feeders even as we speak here. Uh, not all evolutionists are in agreement that dinosaurs evolved into birds. Alan Fiducia, for example, who's a very well-known evolutionist, uh, believes that uh, birds are ultimately related to uh, reptiles, uh, but he's not inclined to believe a lot of the current ideas of dinosaurs evolving into birds. There are several problems with this matter of dinosaurs evolving into birds. Uh, first, let's look at it from the Christian point of view. The Bible makes it pretty clear that birds were created on the fifth day of creation. The Bible says straight away God made every winged fowl of the air. And we know that all of these birds are not a single kind but several kinds because we see in the Levitical dietary laws that there were several kinds of birds that would have reproduced after their own kind. Uh, Land-dwelling animals were created on the sixth day. That would include the dinosaurs. Uh, the reason it includes the dinosaurs is it may surprise some people, but virtually all dinosaurs are classified as land-dwelling uh, creatures. The flying reptiles, like the pterodactyls, are not considered dinosaurs. The aquatic reptiles, like the pleosaurs and plesiosaurs, are not considered dinosaurs. All dinosaurs are terrestrial, so there would have been a sixth day creation. From a scientific point of view, I think the evidence is not compelling that uh, birds came from uh, uh, dinosaurs. Uh, there's several reasons for this. First of all, of course, dinosaurs are reptiles, although you might wonder whether that's even considered to be true nowadays. Uh, many evolutionists prefer to think of dinosaurs as warm-blooded creatures. There's no compelling evidence that they were warm-blooded. Uh, but some of the major differences between birds and dinosaurs are not in the bones, but in the soft tissue of the body, which of course is usually not preserved. For example, uh, the reptile lung uh, is quite different from the bird lung. Uh, birds have a lung which, as far as we know, is not found in uh, any other creature. It's a kind of a through-flow ventilation system where the air goes in uh, through the trachea, uh, but then exits from several positions in the lung to go out into air bags that are under the skin and sandwiched between the muscles. We see nothing like this uh, in uh, uh, reptiles. Uh, 
Recently, fossils were found uh, of a dinosaur in which the soft tissue of the lung was reasonably well preserved, not as soft tissue, but of course mineralized. Uh, this appeared to be very much like a alligator lung, not like a bird lung. So the respiration is quite different, and to turn a, a reptile into a bird would require a really radical difference in the whole respiratory system. Uh, there are other differences as well. Uh, both dinosaurs and birds, uh, at least most of them, have three fingers. Uh, that seems to look similar, except that uh, it's been shown that in the case of the dinosaurs, uh, the three fingers correspond to finger one, two, and three. That would be the thumb, forefinger, and next finger. In the case of birds, the fingers correspond to fingers two, three, and four. So uh, all, almost all uh, vertebrates that uh, walk on four limbs or fly uh, develop in the embryo with five fingers, but uh, here we see uh, the five fingers being reduced to three, and uh, different fingers are used in the dinosaur and the uh, bird, which would suggest they're not related. I think my most compelling evidence that dinosaurs did not evolve into birds is the whole problem of turning a reptile scale into a feather. Uh, these are very different biological structures. Even though both uh, are appendages of the skin and both contain keratins, uh, they are developmentally and every other way very different. Uh, a scale is sort of like a fold in the skin and several scales are one fold after another. That's why scales are shed as a sheet from reptiles. But feathers are shed in matched pairs. In the case of birds, uh, birds do not shed their whole skin the way reptiles do. So that developmentally the structures are different and of course under the microscope it's hard to imagine something uh, that differs more than the structure of a reptile scale on a feather. How to survive secular college. One of the questions I get asked is, how do I, as a biblical creationist, survive secular college? And that's a very legitimate question. It often comes from uh, parents who are about to send their son or daughter off uh, to college for the first time, and they're worried that, they're, that their student is going to walk away from the church. I think that's a legitimate uh, concern. After all, they're getting a lot of information at college, and some of that information is not really true. Some of it is along the lines of pushing toward an evolutionary worldview rather than just being objectively, factually true. Well, how, how then do we deal with this? Well, I think first of all, we need to stay solid in the Word of God, make sure that the student is in the Word of God uh, daily would be best. And I realize it's tough to do that when you're a college student and you have all these other things going on. But it's very important that we, that we allow God to speak to us, and He speaks to us through the Scriptures. Make sure that you're speaking to God through your prayer life, so that's step number two. And then third, make sure that you're in a good Bible-teaching church. And there are lots of compromised churches out there, but there are still, in this world, a number of good Bible-teaching churches. And that's very important that you're there every Sunday, and uh, I know that churches offer a lot of extra programs. You're not going to have time, probably, for a lot of those. But don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Make sure that you get together with other Christians. And also, Sunday church service will remind you if you've, if you've gotten a little bit off in terms of Bible study or prayer, that'll help get you back on track. Uh, fourth, try to find some other students who are like-minded, who believe the Bible and, and are biblically solid, biblical creationists, and that's going to encourage you emotionally, spiritually, and uh, rationally, too. It's going to give you iron sharpening iron type skills where you can um, talk about these sorts of issues. Also, make sure you get answers in Genesis resources. That's going to keep you up to date on the latest issues regarding creation versus evolution and what you're being taught in class. Learn how to think. Uh, you can't memorize all the scientific data, but you can learn how to think and how to process it accurately. And finally, I'd like to offer one more point that I, I know will sound a little bit controversial, but I think it's true. And that is for students who are going into a hard science that deals with origins like biology or astronomy or geology, and not so much other sciences. But if you're going into one of those three, I think you need to be very careful about who you tell that you're a creationist. In fact, I think for your professors, you should not let on that you're a creationist. Now, don't lie but don't volunteer the information. And I hate to say that because we'd like to witness to, to everyone, but uh, it turns out that there are some people out there that just have an ax to grind against creationists. We've known of many cases where students have been stopped from getting their degree if their professor found out that they were a creationist. 
So I think it would be best to work with the system. And there are honest ways you can do that. When you're answering a test, give back the answer the professor wants. You're being tested on what you were taught, not on what you believe. And likewise, when you're writing a paper, you can do it in honest ways. You can say it is generally believed that the world is 4.5 billion years old. Now, you haven't been dishonest there. That's, that's a true statement, and it doesn't reveal what you believe. So just think through how you would answer some things. And then when you get your degree, then you can stand up and say, well, I'm a creationist, and you can use that degree for the glory of God. Genesis, today's answer to racism. What does Genesis have to do with racism? Short answer, everything. You see, what you believe about the past impacts the way that you live your life today. Let me illustrate this for you from a, an experience that I actually had. I was on a live call in television show. The host was a black man named Lincoln. And uh, he, did, he is not a Christian, and he did not believe in creation. And so he was really asking some very straightforward questions with evolution and why I didn't believe in it. And so finally, after probably about 15, 20 minutes, I said to him, I said, Lincoln, would you give me the freedom to say something to you that I don't believe, but it is consistent with your worldview? And he kind of looked at me funny. He said, yes. And I said, so, well, Lincoln, you are a black man. Who do you think you are? Why are you questioning me? I'm a white man. On the evolutionary scale, according to your worldview, I'm up here, I'm more highly evolved than you who are down here. Now, Lincoln, I don't believe that. But you've got to understand something. If you bite off on the belief system that given enough time, right circumstances, that's how we got here, that is consistent. That statement is consistent with that worldview. But I don't believe it, and here's why. Because you see, I have a different starting point. What you believe about the past will impact the way that you live your life today. I have a starting point from a God who tells me that he was always there, he knows what happened. And God said, that needs to become the rallying cry of every Christian, God said. Not what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, God said. God said, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, first man Adam. Genesis 3, 20, Eve was called Eve because she was mother of all living. So therefore, Acts 17, 26, God says that we are all of one blood. Therefore, biblically, there's only one race, the human race, and we are all related. You see, if you believe that, the way that you will talk to other people, the way that you will treat other people who look different than you, that have a different quote unquote skin tone, different eye shape, hair texture, is absolutely going to change. A belief system that says millions of years, given enough time, right circumstances, is how we got here. Then look at the history. America, 1930s, 40s, 50s, early 60s, America was a whole lot more Christian than we are today. I mean, you think about it. There was prayer in the schools. They had the Bible in the schools. Then why is it that up until 1967, it was against the law in 16 states for a person of one drop of non-white blood to marry a white person? Why is it that we in America sterilized over 60,000 people because they were the wrong race, white trash, or feeble-minded? Because you see, we said Jesus with our lips, but we live like the world with our lives. We said, God, I know what you wrote. I know the Bible said that there's one man, one woman. But you didn't understand science, God, because you see, science is proven. Whites are up here. Blacks are down here closer to the missing link. So we said Jesus with our lips, but when we pass those laws to sterilize people and to forbid marriage, we were not consistent with the biblical worldview. What does Genesis have to do with racism? Everything, because what you believe about the past is gonna impact the way that you live your life today. When you start with the Word of God as your authority, you will look at people differently because God said, every person on this planet is a sinner in need of a savior named Jesus Christ. We are all created equal. We are all created in the image of God. Our self-value, our self-worth has nothing to do with what we bring to the plate, with what we have to offer. It has everything to do with what the Creator God did for us, loving us regardless of externals, enough to die on a cross while we were still rejecting Him.